Should I start? Should I start clicking school. through, or is there more to do? You know what? Go right ahead and take over, Bill. I'm I'm going to sit back and uh, let you take it away. Okay. Well, welcome everybody, and thanks for coming out to the uh, weekly success webinar. And when Ron called me up, he says, "Hey, Bill. He says, do you have any more successes? He says, um, I'd like to, you know, you want, do you want to? Say? I said, yes. I just had one. I want to show everybody what I'm doing here." Not a big success, but I thought it was a pretty cool success. So I I, I asked him if I could uh, be featured. So thanks a lot, guys. I appreciate it, especially you, Ron. Okay, so there's pictures of me, right? There's the fancy picture with the suit on. There's the picture with all the checks. That's probably my favorite. And then those are all my animal rescue stuff that we do. That uh, spends most of my time. So let's go on. So what inspired me to take action, right? Um, I am always looking to improve my business and myself. Uh, I am. I'm one of these guys that's always a little bit paranoid of uh, external forces, like what could be out there threatening the business, what could be out there threatening my livelihood, so I want to stay ahead of it. Uh, my claim to fame was I actually made money in the 2008 crash, but my, my saying on that was it wasn't because I was good, it was because I was lucky, and that actually was a, an eye-opening experience. Um, my second expression is that cash flow is everything. I've become a cash flow maniac. Uh, if it doesn't cash flow, don't waste your time talking to me about it. Okay. Uh, I love helping others while I help myself. There's nothing better than being able to help pull others along if you can help or have others pull you along. I mean, it's 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 pretty lonely if you're just doing it yourself. So I always enjoy the community here as we learn more about uh, all these different financial topics and even just personal development. Uh, I like the community aspect of Renatus. That was one of the reasons why I joined. Um, and I learn from others smarter than me. I'm always listening to other people. I have this thing about if, if I'm going to learn, I'd rather learn from other people's mistakes than my own mistakes. So some of the best things you'll ever learn is when somebody else hits the skids. And it may have been no fault of their own, but if you can learn rather than having you hit the skids, uh, it's a lot less painful. And I enjoy working from home. I live in the middle of nowhere, Georgia. I shouldn't say that. It's a really nice area where I live. But um, we are in a county of 18,000 people. So some of you folks have uh, subdivisions with 18,000 people. Okay, so uh, learn how to create value. What inspired me? All these new strategies. Every time I, I go to a, a real estate intensive or take a class, I'm learning something new, how to roll it into my existing business. Uh, again, helping others starting out. Uh, and I learn always from the classes. And, and you know, you, you know some of the things, but it's amazing you don't know what you don't know. Uh, I like what we do because I want to be a part of something big, something big that's growing. And Renatus, I believe, is on the verge of real greatness. So it's great to say, hey, I'm part of that. Uh, I love discussing ideas with others. In fact, when I get into an idea mode, I sometimes, the brain is working three times as fast as I can talk. And that's a good zone to be in. Um, I like helping 50-somethings. I meet a lot of 50-somethings that are struggling. Oh, I talked to a guy today who's struggling so hard. I mean, 50-something years old. And I mean, he's really, uh, you know, just almost broke. And, and it's like, how can I help guys and gals like that? Uh, I like to help my community, right? It's not only yourself, but the, the people in the the whole community. And uh, Renatus helps me do that. So that's the reasons I'm here. And I like to help the, my customers. And in these cases, these are some of my tenants that have worked with me and are going to end up owning or actually own their houses. So I'm not a landlord. I am a financial superhero. And I do everything from soup to nuts. So it's a lot of fun. Okay. So what's happening since I found Renatus? Ooh, a lot of stuff. Uh, I opened up two self-directed IRAs. I have rentals in those IRAs anywhere from 30 to 100% a year. And now I'm becoming a real fan of seller finance notes. So I'm migrating from landlord into bank. Uh, I tell the story about I saved $32,000 at a closing table by working a negotiations uh, strategy that I <clears throat> learned in the, in the class. And I'm constantly buying new rentals because rentals, uh, cash flowing real estate is just the way it is. I'm not much of a transaction guy. It's too, you guys that do fixes and flips, you're working too hard. Uh, I learned how to raise unlimited 
cash, unlimited money for real estate. I actually learned from Renatus in the marketing classes. One of Scott Rowe's videos, I converted it from marketing money to real estate money, and now I have money chasing me. I have to turn people down. I'm like, oh, I can't take your money. Just here, you got to take it back. Uh, I have different ways that I raise money. In fact, you know what's the strange thing about money is once you really learn how to raise money, it, it comes at you from all sorts of directions. I'd already had plenty of money for my deals, and I talked to a bank, and the bank offered me an unlimited line of credit. And it's so funny because it's like, geez, when I needed the money, you guys weren't there. But now that you don't need the money, they're like, oh, yeah, as much as you want. And I love the velocity banking strategy. Uh, I think that's just incredibly valuable. And I often wonder, why don't the banks teach that in the United States? Hmm. But we all know why. Okay, so today's success story. So all the things, rental, real estate, notes, all that. Well, now we're going to go on to something else. Buying tax deeds. Never bought a tax deed before. But the opportunity hey, presented Bill. itself. Yeah. I didn't want to interrupt you, but uh, before we start throwing the numbers around, let's go over the legalese real quick so everyone's... Oh, that's uh, being... right. I'm sorry. Got, that's okay. Uh, got to gotta share that. So everyone, please understand that uh, before... Bill discusses any more number details of what he's doing. These earnings, these real estate investments, his numbers he's sharing, these are shared strictly to tell the facts of his own story. We are not here to make any kind of income guarantees because we all know investing comes with an inherent level of risk. And that's exactly why we find it extremely important to invest the time, money, and energy into our education to minimize that risk and maximize our profit. So, Bill, you've made the commitment to your education and put it into action, and I know that's what you're going to share here. Just want to make sure that everyone understands we're not giving any kind of income guarantees. Good. Okay, so now that we've said that, can we go on? Now we can go on, right? Hey, thanks, <laughs> I'm Bill. I'm teasing you. Okay. So, you think those are houses, right? Those aren't houses. Those are money-making machines. So let's talk about tax deeds. I went to a tax deed auction, God, beginning of August, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, and I bought a tax deed for the little house on the left for $1,500, and the fair market value is about forty. dollars and I bought the tax deed on the right for $2,000, and the fair market value is probably about sixty-five dollars to seventy. dollars So... Uh, tell you the story. Uh, before I went to the tax auction, before I started putting real money at it, I did research on how tax deeds and tax liens work, especially in Georgia. So I looked up the chapter and verse. Uh, I visited the county commissioner, uh, tax commissioner, and I asked lots of questions. I went in and I, and I said, "Okay, county tax commissioner, how does this tax lien, this tax deed thing work?" And I got some printouts from them, and they were very helpful in telling me how it works, how the auction mechanics work, um, where it was going to be, what time, which I pretty much knew already. But I picked their brains as much as possible. And I actually attended a previous auction, at least one or two, and uh, these were before I started bidding. So I went to a couple of auctions, and I sort of sat there and watched what happens, and I talked to some investor bidders. So I watched who the players were, and afterwards I went up to them and I congratulated them on their acquisitions and just asked them a couple of questions. It's amazing. They were very uh, very forthwith in information. Uh, they, they enjoyed talking. Uh, okay, so when this auction came up, I was like, okay, well, maybe it's time to pull the trigger here. So I, out of about 200 properties that were in the paper, and this is how they do it in Georgia, they advertise four consecutive weeks in Georgia, but... It really doesn't make sense to go look at properties until the last week because as they're advertising these properties, they're getting paid off. So if you start at the beginning of the four-week cycle and you start looking at 200 properties, you're going to waste a lot of time because most of them are going to get paid off. So what I did was I just mapped out about 20 properties and then I think it was the Friday before the Tuesday auction went to the county commissioner, the tax commissioner, and said, okay, which ones of these are still open? And they'll give you the list, right? So they gave me a list, and they said, okay, these are open. So I visited, and then I got on the tax, uh, tax assessor's website, checked out the properties that I thought might have merit. And I, over the weekend, I visited 10 to 12 properties, 
And like I said, it was a little bit of a headache going around all those properties, but you got to do it. You got to do the due diligence. And then Sunday night, I watched my tax deeds class with Coach Gavin. So I figured, okay, uh, let me watch this class. So it's almost like cramming for the finals. So here I was watching this thing. I just watched it like all straight through. Boom, 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 boom. To get any more tips about what was good. And of course, I learned some things from that class, which I rolled into this whole process. And some of the things I was interested in, and I knew some of it, but rights of redemption, because a lot of the tax deeds and liens have a right of redemption, where the previous owner or the person behind on their taxes can redeem their property by paying you an interest plus your principal back. I was interested in how the junior liens worked out. Uh, there's a quiet title process, because even after the redemption period, doesn't mean you get the property right away. You just have the right to basically foreclose, okay? At the end of the, in this Georgia, this is one year period. Okay, so how did the quiet title process work? Uh, learn the difference between penalty and interest. Okay, very interesting. In Georgia, we have a penalty. We don't have interest, which means if I buy a tax deed today and the person pays me off tomorrow, they owe me a 20% penalty. They don't owe me interest, which is calculated daily. So whether they redeem it on day number one or day number 364, it's still 20%. So I said, that's cool. Um, looked at some bidding techniques. I watched some of the people at the previous auctions on how to bid, and I'll talk about some bidding techniques that really work. Also, IRS liens. IRS liens are a little different. IRS liens can actually be superior to tax liens. But what it turns out is the IRS has a right of redemption also. So if you buy a piece of property at a tax auction, the IRS, I think it's six months, has a six month right of redemption, meaning they can step in and buy you out. And the reason is, this is mostly used with drug kingpins. So let's say a, a mansion, a $2 million drug mansion, uh, gets auctioned off because of taxes. The IRS, and let's say the guy owes a million dollars in taxes, the IRS will step up and pay off that lien so it can sell the property and recoup some of its losses. It almost never happens, but it's still there. So it's one of those things like, okay, I understand. That's not a threat. Uh, payment requirements. How do you pay? Let's say you're the winning bidder at an auction. Do you have to hand them uh, a cashier's check or a bank check right on the spot? Do you have any time to go get the money? Um, sometimes in, in our world, it was it's pretty informal, but when I asked the tax commissioner, she says, well, if the auction's at, at 10 a.m., if you can have the money to us by 1.30, we're okay. And what's funny is I said, do I have to have certified funds? She goes, no, I know you. You're in here all the time. You can just give us a check. <laughs> we trust you. <laughs> so I didn't have to go get a bank check because I'm in a small town. Okay, so what's that? Is that everything there? Yeah. Oh, here's something that was interesting. What was the point I wanted to make? Um, oh, Georgia has an interesting phenomenon. The way Georgia works, let's say there's a $2,000 tax lien. Okay, they start the bid at $2,000. If somebody bids $2,000, the bidding keeps going up. So let's say the house is worth $100,000. The bidders can bid that up to $50,000. And the extra money will go towards the junior liens. Remember I mentioned junior liens? So $2,000 would go to the county for the taxes. But if there's a mortgage, a second mortgage, whatever, the extra money will go towards paying off those junior liens. I thought that was pretty elegant so that those guys don't get totally wiped out. Now, the problem is for the homeowner or the previous homeowner, is that they now owe the 20% penalty on the total bid. So if somebody bids up a property from a $2,000 lien to $50,000, to redeem it, they have to come up with $50,000 plus 20%. And what this creates is in the, big, in the big counties, there are what they call the syndicates. The syndicates are money people that bid up these auctions up to, let's say, 50% of value because all they're interested in is that 20% penalty.
penalty. They don't care about the properties. They're hoping they won't get the properties. But they want the 20% return. And that distorts the marketplace for the little investor. Because little investor can't compete with that. So it, just a thing about Georgia, it's the way we do auctions. You, they keep bidding them up until st the people stop bidding. And then, so the, the actual sale price could be way above what's owed in the taxes. Just something interesting that I learned. Okay, so let's go on. So we're looking at that. What were the lessons learned? What I learned was when I went to the auction, there were about 22 people on the courthouse steps. Ah, but it turns out there were only about four real bidders. Most of them were observers. Most of them were like I was the last auction. They were all down there to see what it was all about. So if you guys are looking at tax auctions, you might, you know, you see 50 people at the courthouse steps. It may not be as many real players as you think. There may be just a lot of people watching. Okay, so that was my situation. Um, most were good for one bid. So the players that were actually bidding, they would bid the initial bid, but they were weak hands. In other words, they couldn't stand a, to get bid up. Um, when I bought this $1,500 tax lien, I think the original bid was like $1,120. And um, I think I bid $1,120, and the next guy said $1,200. So he bid it up by $80. And I said, oh, yeah, I'm going to try something. So I said $1,500, and he just backed right down. I scared him off with a, a, a substantial increase in the bid. It's like he was like, oh, this guy's going to bid it up, and I, I, can't, I can't touch him. So that's how I ended up getting that one. Um, here's another phenomenon that was interesting. Once I bought the first lien... The other bidders were afraid of me. They now, all of a sudden, I was the, you know, I was the, the alpha bidder. And everyone was watching me because I wasn't afraid to bid. Most of the people were afraid to bid. Um, oh, I did a favor for an investor. I had an investor sitting next to me who wanted to bid on a property, but she hadn't visited the property or she just drove by it. And I had known from this property that it was actually burned out on the inside. So the outside didn't look too bad, but the inside was totally destroyed by fire. And she, she was going to bid on it, and I said, don't bid on that property. I said, it's burned out. Have you been by there? And she's like, well, I drove by it. I said, you didn't see the burnout? I said, don't bid on that property. And she was <laughs> very thankful. She's like, oh, thank you for telling me. I would have bought this thing. I would have bought a, you know, a bad deal. So hopefully I get some good karma out of that. Um, oh, this is a good story. So one of the novice bidders that was at the, the, the auction was actually drove all the way from Atlanta. And uh, I had a conversation with him. But I didn't invite him to a Renatus meeting. I didn't revive. Guess what? The next week, guess who shows up at the Renatus meeting? The guy that I didn't invite. <laughs> I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> So there's another story of invite everybody because you're going to find your brother is going to end up at a Renatus meeting and he's going to be protected to somebody else besides you. So one of the bidders who drove 90 miles out there somehow ended up at a Renatus meeting the next week. Okay. Uh, in Georgia, 12-month right of redemption, and then you file for quiet title. Okay, and that's, that's just the way it is. And again, these terms may be a little bit... Um, Strange for people, but the, the terms of the business. Oh, and in my conversations with investors, one of the other investors showed me how to buy out a right of redemption. What he does, and this is a strategy for you guys, he gets the property, it has a 12-month right of redemption, but then after a few months, he visits the property and he talks to the owner. And a lot of times, the owner knows they're going to be leaving for whatever reason, and he will say, well, listen, instead of me waiting um, 12 months to get the right of redemption, can I help you move? Can I, can I basically buy out your right of redemption for moving money? And he says, you wouldn't believe how many properties. He says, I have accelerated the right of redemption by um, like $1,000. You know, a U-Haul and a security deposit for the next place. So I haven't done that yet, but it was an interesting strategy, right? Because 
There's a problem with the right of redemption period in Georgia, which is you can't touch the property. It's almost like it's, it's this, this no man's land where you own it technically, but you can't do anything with it. You're not supposed to talk to the, well, you can talk to them, but you're not supposed to, you don't harass the uh, occupants or anything, right? So anyway, that was an interesting thing where he says, no, no, I buy out their right of redemption. Okay, so keep that in mind if you ever do notes or uh, tax deeds. And then insure, for, oh, oh, here was a question I had. I said, okay, if I own the property now, do I have to insure it? Because think about it, I have a tax deed, which means I have ownership. If somebody hurts themselves on this property, who are they going to go after? I talked to my insurance guy and he says, well, they're going to go after you because you're the owner of record because of the tax deed. I said, oh, so you might want to have liability, at least liability insurance on the property. Because if someone was to terribly hurt themselves and sue you for a million dollars, you don't have any protection. So my insurer wrote me a liability policy, like an umbrella for the two properties. And I think it was like 170 bucks for the whole year for both properties. I didn't feel like putting homeowner's insurance on it because there wasn't enough money to worry about it. But I wanted liability insurance. And it was funny because no one had asked that question down at the county tax commissioner. Right? She's like, well, I don't know. Nobody's ever asked that question. I'm going, okay, well, we better find out because I don't want to end up in, a, in jeopardy. So there was another thing that I learned. Okay. Oh, and here's the thing. Look, there's a big difference between knowing how to do something and actually doing it, right? It's great to take a class. It's great to read a book. It's great to watch a video. But at some point, you've got to put some real money on the line or some real skin in the game and, and pull the trigger. Like once you feel confident, and look, it might take a little longer, it might take less longer. Hopefully it's a small amount of money. In my case it was. And but it's like one of the reasons why I actually did it was so funny, because when the property came up and the person says I think the second first property and they said eleven hundred dollars and and nobody bid on it. So it was like, uh, well, uh, okay, $1,120, I'll bid on it. It's like, okay, I'm in play, here we go. <laughs> it's pretty, a little bit of adrenaline going through me at that point. Uh, but actually, you know, taking the chance and pulling the trigger with all your knowledge, with all your, you know, everything you've gathered, and you make an intelligent choice, right? So I don't know if they'll redeem these properties or not. Um, but if they don't, I'm looking at $100,000 worth of equity for a $3,500 investment. And that's a pretty good, that's pretty good ratios in my world. Okay, so what's happened since I joined Renatus? Oh, well, let me go back before we go down. Any questions about the tax lien stuff? Ta it's tax deeds. I shouldn't say liens. There's a difference between liens and deeds. Any questions that I can answer? Again, I'm not an expert. I just did two of them. <laughs> but now I'm, wait, I'm, I'm looking forward to the next auction. Because I actually, I actually would have bid on some other houses that I didn't because I was too nervous on the first one. We're doing great on time. I'll wait well, for thanks. Rodney's question. I might as well answer questions. We're doing good. We're almost we're on time. No, go ahead. I was just going to fill in while Rodney's typing. Yeah, Scott, that, that whole thing of... What's that? Okay. Okay. Yeah, that whole concept of buying out the redemption period. Now, and I, I gotta check and make sure that's legit. But I think it is. I think. I don't know. I don't. I shouldn't say I think. I've got to check it before I do it. But the concept seems sound, right? Oh, I know what it was. Yes, it is sound because what they could do is they could they could quit claim me their interest, right? They could quit claim me their interest, which means they wouldn't have a right of redemption anymore. I can't see why that would be a problem. Okay, uh, what is the difference between a lien and a, okay, you're asking a guy who just took a, one class, so you might want to ask Coach Gavin that, but a lien and a deed, it's ownership versus debt. So a tax deed, you actually get title to the property. A tax lien, you have a superior lien against the property, okay? So I would think, and again, check with coach, but 
if, if you have a lien, you don't have possession, right? And I don't think you have an insurable interest, which would be an interesting thing. If you had a tax lien and the place burned down, I think you're just out of luck. Okay, but a tax deed, well, if you have a deed, you have ownership, that's, that's, that's liability, responsibility, plus you have an insurable interest. So ownership versus debt is the difference between lien. And people talk about them interchangeably. So it's, it's close to the same thing, but there are subtle differences. And if I was going to do hundreds of these, I would know everything about them. And maybe I will in the future do hundreds, I don't know. I'll wait for Jason's question if he's got something. And again, guys, you're talking to a guy who just bought two. So I'm not the authority. I'm just, I might just be uh, one step further ahead than some of you guys. That's all. So a tax deed is favorable. How common are they? Every state is different, Jason. I don't know if liens and deeds, I don't know the ratio across the United States. In fact, I believe some states actually have liens and deeds. If I remember from the class from Coach Gavin. Um, there's a map he has. I don't know where he got it, but it's in the class that explains what each state has. So all I know is only know two states. I know Georgia. I know Alabama because I live close to Alabama. So they both have deeds. Okay, that's how common they are. But every every state has a mechanism to get its tax money. Okay, every state, because look, the state's going to get its money, it's got to keep its schools going, its police, its fire departments. If people don't pay the taxes, somebody's going to pay the taxes. And that's why this whole thing is put together, because you got to pay the taxes to keep society going, right? Okay, so let's go on, because I don't want to run out of time here, 727. Okay, so what happened since I joined Renatus? Well, I've done, I call them the buy, hold, and flip. I'm not a big um, fix and flip guy. But I will buy a property, fix it enough to rent it for a year, and then sell it after a year. Why do I wait one year before I sell it? This is a good question for you guys, tax and legal strategies. Why do I wait one year before I take that big old check? Well, if no one else is typing nope. in. Nope. Ah, uh, Scott Not seasoning. Got it. Long-term capital gains. Oh, ding, 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 ding. Scott gets it. Right. So if I, I actually had a property once that I delayed the closing because I wanted to get it past the one-year date. They wanted to buy the property, and I looked at the numbers, and I said, oh, I've got to delay it for an extra week. So I would take the long-term capital gains because there's a discount on it, right? So it's similar to seasoning. Don't feel bad, Frank. You're, you're almost there. It's another way of saying it. Okay. okay. But the big thing that I've learned here is passive income. Uh, I am a passive income guy. I would rather get stacks of checks every month than one big check. I like I like streams of income. I like notes. I like anything that puts checks in my P.O. box is good. Anything that doesn't ain't so good. Oh, and I tell a story on one of my previous ones where I got a free house from the deal. I actually got a free house on one of my real estate deals. And, oh, I got another. This is the story of previous one where I bought a $200,000 house for sixty grand into my IRA. I actually helped somebody out. I did them a favor by buying their $200,000 house for sixty grand. I know it sounds strange, but it was true. Okay, so key personal lessons. Uh, creating unlimited tax-free wealth is relatively simple. It's actually pretty simple to create tax-free wealth. Once you understand, once you avoid income, I hate creating income because they tax income. So anything I can do that's not income, that's either wealth or cash flow, I'm all in. Uh, and money is never a problem if you create value. If you create enough value, money chases after you. Lack of money is actually a symptom. It's not a problem. Lack of money is a symptom of a lack of knowledge and a lack of relationships. If you have knowledge and you have relationships, money... you. you you trip over money. You got to like kick it out of the way. It, it's it's in your it's in your way. Collaboration is better than competition. I I have given away multi million dollar ideas to people because I learn from doing that. Right? That's not the way the world is. The world is like ah, oh, I got to keep mine, and you don't you know if if you get you're gonna get mine and dog eat dog and all that crap. Now that's not what wealthy people do. Wealthy people collaborate. Because they know that that it's there's infinite possibilities, 
And you don't know what you don't know. Every time I learn something, it's like, oh, crap, how come I didn't know that? Oh, okay, well, if I don't know that, what else don't I know? And so on and on and on and on. And let me tell you guys, will there be another real estate crash? Yes! Yes, there will be! There will be! Let me be the first to tell you! So you might want to have strategies that you don't get eviscerated like so many people in 2008. Okay? And if you start telling yourself it's different this time, oh, go and hit yourself with a wet noodle or something. It's not different this time. There will be another crash. There will be tears before bedtime. So make sure what you're doing you won't get hurt, right? Okay. Oh, here's a good one. Look, if you can't change your friends, if you're hanging out with people that don't get it, scarcity, fear, or loss, always, you know, I don't know what they're doing, but it could be very close friends to yours. You might have to hang out with some different people. You just might have to. It doesn't mean you don't love the other people. It's just like, look, man, you know, you're killing me. I got I to gotta hang out with people that aren't different. I got to tell you a story. This is a good story. I still have relatives. These are some of my old rel older relatives that when I go to like a family function, now I haven't had a job since 2005. So that's what, 13 years? And I got laid off. So I will go to family functions, weddings and things like that. And my older relatives will come up and they'll say, they call me Billy, right? Oh, Billy, have you, have you found anything yet? I'm like, what are you talking about, Aunt, Aunt, Aunt Joan? Oh, you know, heard about how tough it is out there and you know have you found a new job I mean you know do you need some help or you know that type of thing. it's so funny because it's like well I, I think I'm okay I think I'm, I'm okay I'm okay you sure now you sure because you know Jimmy can get you get you in with the union down at uh, the pipe fitters union 103 right I'm like no nah, no nah, I think I think I'm okay I appreciate it okay uh, hope and luck are poor investment strategies hope and luck do not live your life on hope and luck because if you turns out wrong, man, you get crushed, right? 2008, oh, there were a lot of lucky people until they weren't, okay? So, if you, you know, control your own destiny. Oh, here's a good one, though, and I've learned this because I have lots of customers. My customers, I, my tenants are my customers, my investors are my customers, the sellers of property that I'm buying are my customers, my community is my customers. My code enforcement people are my customers. My bankers are my customers. And I, I'm learning, and it's a constant struggle, but I keep learning, that to measure value in your customer's eyes, not what you think is valuable. You will, you will become so much more successful if you pay attention to what other people consider is valuable, not what you consider is valuable. Okay, it is a huge thing that holds you back. I've learned this with tenants like crazy, crazy. Okay, so keep that in mind. That's it. Okay, there's opportunity. Is that it? Yep. Okay, that's it. Any questions for me? Uh, we're at 7:33, so we're wrapping up, and then I'll let Ron do the do the finale here. It will be great to meet you and talk to you. Yeah, yeah, come to Atlanta. Atlanta. I'm looking forward to it, man. A lot of good people in Atlanta. Do, 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 do.